The Voodoo 5 5500 was released 21 years ago on June 22, 2000. It was meant to herald the return of 3D effects to the top of the graphics card food chain and further cement its legacy as the company who brought 3D gaming to the masses. Instead, it failed to overcome the offerings from competitors like Nvidia and ATI, and finally it became the last graphics card to be released by 3D effects before they filed for bankruptcy and were acquired by Nvidia in 2002. Today, we'll build this awesome relic a new throne to sit in, and we'll see what the final flagship of our forgotten 3D forefathers is capable of. The Voodoo 5 5500 features dual VSA100 graphics processors running at 166MHz. Those two cores are supported by 64 megs of SD memory, 32 megs each. It originally sported a price tag of $299 US dollars, which equates to roughly about $450 today. And compared to the scalper prices of the RTX 3080, that seems downright reasonable. The card came in both a PCI and AGP2X flavor, and mine is the latter. It also has a precursor to a feature that's become a staple on modern graphics card. It needed more power than the bus could provide, so it included an additional Molex connector to draw power directly from the power supply. Of course, a graphics card is only as capable as its supporting hardware, so let's take a look at the other components that are going to go into this rig. I've chosen to go AMD with this build, and I'll be using this ASUS A7A266 board. I picked it due to its support of a wide range of AGP cards, its ability to use the 133MHz frontside bus, and the fact that it has no integrated video or sound, making it pretty bare bones. I'll be coupling that with an AMD XP1700. It's a single core socket A processor running at 1.5GHz. Yeah, AMD's naming convention during this time was a little confusing. I think the naming might have been to show what the targeted comparisons were between it and Intel processors, like an XP1700 runs as fast as a Pentium 4 1.7GHz? Uh, I don't know. Of course, we'll need some RAM for this build as well. The A7A266 supports both SD and DDR RAM, and I've chosen the latter. These sticks don't match, one being 266 and the other one being 333MHz, but it should downclock the 333MHz to 266, so I don't foresee a problem here. For storage, I was originally tempted to go with a SATA PCI card and a more modern SSD, but after reports that Windows 98 can severely lower the life expectancy of those drives, I opted for the aptly named SD to IDE adapter. As the name suggests, it allows me to use an SD card as an IDE hard drive. And I'll be pairing it with a 32GB SD card. As a bonus, I'll be able to easily pop this card out and plug it into a modern computer, allowing me to transfer additional software with ease. This optical drive is quite a bit newer than the build. It's an IDE DVD-RW slash CDR combo that supports LightScribe and it should work just fine. For cooling the CPU, I have a pretty generic cooler. It should do the job, but unfortunately the 60mm fan on it has gotten pretty gunked up and noisy over the years. So I'll be upgrading it with this ultra-quiet Noctua fan. It's not the perfect size replacement for it, but I should be able to make it work. And without a mechanical hard drive and minimal fan noise, this machine's going to be silent but deadly. For audio support, we're going with a Sound Blaster Live Value 5.1. The Sound Blaster Live just seemed to be the de facto standard back then. I don't know if that was just me, but it seemed like they were everywhere. For network connectivity, I've got this TP-Link that runs the Realtek 8169 chipset, which should work just fine under Windows 98. And finally, we need something to build it all into. I wanted something that was newer, but wouldn't look too out of place when sat next to a CRT and all beige components, and the Fractal Design Focus G Tower fit the bill to a T. Plus it has a window on the side, so the whole world's gonna know I'm running a Voodoo 5. Well, all the players are here, so let's get this bad boy built and get to some gaming.
and we have most of the unit assembled, but before we finish the cable management, it's a good idea to test it just in case any of the components aren't playing nice with each other. And we've frozen up on boot up, can't even get into the BIOS. Okay, I will do some troubleshooting and be right back. And after about a half an hour of swapping components around, it looks like it was the network card. But I took it out, cleaned up the contacts, and reinstalled it, and now everything seems to be fine. So, yay for simple fixes. Now it's time to install Windows 98 before completing assembly on the tower. And Windows is installed, but quite noticeably lacking drivers, so let's fix that. Ah, much better. Everything seems to be pretty stable, so I'm going to go ahead and get everything closed up. Only snag is the SD to IDE adapter. I don't really have a good way to mount it, so I'll design and 3D print a bracket for that next. And here we have our completed build, with parts that haven't seen any gameplay in the better part of a decade, or perhaps two. Now, it's time to take the reins off this build and let it get back to what it was designed to do. Writing documentation and balancing spreadsheets. No, I'm just kidding. Let's bring on the games. But before we do that, I decided to run 3D Mark 2001 to see what kind of benchmark score this gets. And we have a 1622. And honestly, I have no idea how that compares to other cards, but I wanted to run a benchmark anyways. The first game I'll be tackling here is Star Trek Elite Force. Based on the Quake 3 engine, it puts you in control of Ensign Moreau of Hazard Team on the USS Voyager. And this is a game that I thought looked exceptionally awesome in the past. The first level has you exploring a Borg ship trying to save the rest of your team, and they did a really good job at recreating the atmosphere of a Borg cube. Of course, you can't have a Voyager game without having the actual ship, and they have built a lot of the sets into the game, including the main bridge. And while they took liberties from the show by always allowing you to have your weapon set to kill, it still feels like a choose-your-own-adventure episode. Set your phasers to frag. And now that I've committed treason against the Federation, perhaps it's time to move on to a different game. Get down to engineering and help Alana seal that leak. Since Elite Force was based on the Quake 3 engine, it's probably no surprise that Quake 3 runs exceptionally well on it too. In fact, there are quite a few games based on the Quake 3 engine and they should all perform great. Gameplay is buttery smooth and fast paced and just what a deathmatch should feel like. Awesome. The Need for Speed series was one of the early adopters of 3DFX glide technology, and the jump forward in video quality was mind-blowing. The difference between Need for Speed 2 with and without glide seemed to be night and day. I don't remember what I was using for a graphics card before I got my first Voodoo, but I couldn't believe what I'd been missing. Unfortunately, Need for Speed 2 was not written with the Voodoo 5 in mind, so it doesn't detect the GPU on install. 
Luckily, all you have to do is copy the nfs2sea.exe file from the root of the CD to your install folder, and then run that instead of the included executable and you get Glide support back. Unfortunately, the lack of Voodoo 5 support continues into Need for Speed 3. So, while it will run in direct 3D mode, I've been unable to get it to run off Glide. I found posts online referring to patches and registry edits, but I have yet to find the files required. If you happen to have them, let me know in the comments, I'd love to see this run. Unreal Tournament is another very Glide-friendly game. I played it for way longer than this video required and never experienced any slowdowns. First blood. Honestly, I wish I had this box back in the day to carry to LAN tournaments. <laughs> Actually, probably not. If I had had something that performed this well back then, I wouldn't have been able to blame my rig for my lack of stellar performance. Descent Free Space is another game that supports 3DFX games out of the box, and as expected, it performs well. Not a lot to see in the void of space, but it's still cool. And of course, since this machine is running Windows 98 and uses a Sound Blaster Live card for audio, DOS support is quite good. It was even able to run Duke 3D with Vesa support. The audio in the menu got a little choppy, but the gameplay was perfect. And this just touches the surface of the games that are available with 3DFX support. In fact, 3DFX support for games was so prominent that people have worked really hard to get it up and running in DOSBox, as well as writing wrappers to get full glide support on other graphics cards. I look forward to tracking down a catalog of games for this machine that I didn't have access to when I was younger, and replaying the ones that I did. Hey, thank you so much for watching until the end. I hope you enjoyed this look back at the Voodoo 5. If you like old hardware, then make sure to subscribe because there's plenty more coming in the future. And let me know in the comments below if you had a 3FX card back in the day and what you loved playing on it because I'm always looking for new games to try out. Well, that's it for this one, but I'll see you back here in a couple of weeks for another retrospective.